So first of all, uh, thank you, Mario, uh, and the organization for the invitation here to talk about uh, here return to play after ACL injury in football players. Um, as we already heard in the previous presentations, we know that it can be a big challenge to return to sport or football in this case, but it can be even a bigger challenge to return to performance um, after returning to sport. So this can be a problem uh, for the athletes, coaches, uh, or all people involved in the uh, return to play uh, decision-making process. So what we see is that uh, players after returning to football um, have less starting games, are less used in games, um, play less minutes, have also a shorter career duration, score less goals, and have uh, also a lower number of completed passes. So based on the current evidence, even in the highest levels in Europe, at elite level, we see or we have some evidence that performance levels are lower after returning to football which is quite disappointing and which is also maybe reason to think about how we can do better. Um, and I think one way to do better, of course, it's, is uh, your, our rehabilitation approaches. High quality rehab is, is a key factor in the whole process where different people have to work together. Um, and I think that's also how we proposed uh, the whole rehab process that we should consider the whole rehab process as a continuum, meaning that your rehab already starts immediately after the injury with pre-op rehab, followed by, it, followed by reconstruction if needed, and then criterium-based post-op rehab uh, with regular testing, which I will uh, come back to today, uh, working together as a team, and then followed by a gradual return to sport, um, and follow up. This is how we consider a more optimal approach for return to sport after ACL injury. Um, and I'll try to visualize a little bit more in this uh, figure here, where I want to mention that if we do training, then each training session or each training exercise should be based on clear goal setting. And this goal setting sh should also be based on testing. And this is not only at the end of the rehab, but actually across the whole continuum of ACL rehab, we set goals based on clear testings and we set, or these goal settings will then be uh, our, our starting point to, to form our training, okay? So what is now the difference between, for example, handball or soccer or basketball, whatever sport you talk about? Um, well, of course, the sports, specificity is, can be different, but I think there are also some uh, common rehab approaches uh, needed to create what, what I call athletic capacity before you can go to jumping, running, change direction. Uh, there are some common uh, commonalities across sports that you need to target your rehabilitation. But of course, you take into account, and that's also a very important part of rehabilitation, uh, the specific aspects of football. And therefore, uh, it's always important to start or to begin with the end in mind. What is your end goal? Where do you want to go to? These are crit critical questions before you even can start with your rehabilitation. Before you can go a step by step by step towards your end goal, of course, you first need to know uh, what is your end goal. And uh, by knowing your end goal, you should, uh, of course, have some information on the individual requirements of football. So what is football? Um, actually, um, from a physiological or physical point of view, uh, football is a, is a maximal intermittent sport. Uh, we know that each five to six seconds you will change your activity. It can be running, sprinting, uh, high-speed running, accelerations, decelerations, kicking, um, lateral movements or uh, passes. So you have different kind of activities. Uh, which are combined in a quite complex environment where other people or, or teammates run around you, uh, where you also have to follow tactical instructions from the coach. So at the end, we know that both physical, tactical, technical, and psychological factors will all contribute to the complex game of um, football. And 
for those who just uh, watch football uh, for the television, they, they might think, okay, it, it might be an easy game. But once you're on the pitch, you can see also in this video that it's really complex when you are on the field, surrounded by other players, where you have to move as fast as possible, to think uh, while you're uh, moving, and to take into account all the factors around of you. So I'll come back to that later, because this is also quite a challenging process, not only for your body, but also for your brain. So what I want to target here today, or how I want to structure my presentation, is starting uh, with uh, the analogy of the uh, tip of the iceberg. And what, I, what, what do I mean here? I think what we currently do, uh, or what we think we know, has been improved over the couple of last couple of years. But I think there are still so many things uh, we don't apply yet in clinical practice. Uh, things we know we don't know, but also things we don't know, we don't know, which might be uh, become more clear in the next couple of years. Um, and to be able to structure a rehab process, I think it's, it's always good to make uh, a distinction between factors that need to be trained or need to be tested. And therefore, I, uh, based on current literature, I, I, I propose here this, these five pillars. And the first one is neuromuscular performance. Why is that? Because one of the most consistent findings in literature is that uh, footballers who have returned to football um, have consistent uh, deficits in strength, but also in basic performance tests, such as uh, jump testing, for example. Now, one of the reasons uh, we could hypothesize why that would be is that players are underloaded during rehab. And based on the underloading, it could be that players are unprepared to return to their activities. And then when they return, um, they could be overloaded, which could lead to um, less optimal outcomes. This is what I call here, in line with Tim Gabbett's work, the chronic ACL rehab circle, where we really have to try to get, get out to them. And one of the most consistent findings in literature is the lack of quadriceps strength, even when players have uh, returned to sport is a quad deficit, one of the most common presentations in literature, uh, not only in football players, but actually in overall in, in patients after ACL reconstruction. So this is a clear, uh, very important point that we need to target in our rehab from the beginning on with isolated strength training to overcome these deficits. Now, I think in literature, there is a over-reliance on, on uh, maximal strength. And I don't say it's not important. No, that's not uh, at all what I'm saying. But I think when we go to make the translation to its performance, there are a lot of other factors that should also be taken into account. Because when we, take in, when we look at, for example, jumping, change of direction, sprinting, explosive athletic tasks, you don't have uh, time enough to develop your maximal force. So then other factors come into play, such as weight of force development, reactive strength, uh, and power, which can also be, um, of, can also have some underlying mechanisms from a neurological point of view, which are not target today. But I think it's important to look further than the classic tests that we often uh, use in clinical practice, especially when we want to return to performance. So how can we do that, or why is it important? It's important because not because you are uh, performing well during high force, low velocity uh, testings or tasks, but you're also doing well during high velocity, low force movements. So in this slide, you see some examples to target these neuromuscular uh, performances across the whole uh, force velocity profile. So we should not only stick to very slow movements, but we should also target our interventions towards the individual presentation and across the whole force velocity profile. Now, one of the uh, interventions, which is also uh, important here, is plyometrics. And the problem here is that we often uh, instruct our patients to land very softly and to take a lot of time to be on the ground. But actually, when, again, when you want to return to performance, what we need is very short contact times and high forces to be able to sprint, to be able to change direction. So at the end, we really go to high load, short contact times, 
And this is really uh, something we should uh, implement in training, step by step, of course, not uh, at once, but step by step, we prog progress towards the bottom uh, right here in the corner. And I think in the previous presentations, it was also already clear that when we talk about football, um, it's not enough to think that we are successful if we do just don't su sustain a new a knee injury. We also think about the epidemiology of football injuries, such as groin injuries, hamstring, rectus femoris injuries, uh, calf muscle injuries, ankle injuries. And um, when your player is out uh, for the next six months with, for example, uh, hamstring problems after returning to sport, still, I don't think we can, we can talk about a successful return to sport. So we really aim at that preparation in function of football. That's really key, okay? From neurological performance perspective. A second pillar I want to mention here today is movement quality. So movement quality um, can be assessed clinically or uh, in labs, of course. But when we, again, uh, make the analogy with the tip of the iceberg, I think uh, we typically focus too much on just linear movements, forward movements, remember hop testing, where we typically only evaluate quantitative, uh, from a quantitative uh, way, such as distance or maybe the height. Uh, or when we look at movement, we focus often only at the knee. While we know that it's much more complicated uh, from a biomechanical point of view, uh, and we need to in implement uh, more whole task and whole body mechanics, um, not only during the deepest landing phase, but also during the deceleration phase, during the transfer phase and the acceleration phase to propose ourselves and to become performant again. Not only in very anticipated movements, but also in multidirectional, unanticipated high speed movements, potentially also with perturbations. So again, these are all um, factors to, 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 to target uh, our rehab process and our athletes to become uh, more uh, proficient or performant during the game. Huh? So again, it's not, it's always important to focus on the whole task, both during deceleration tasks uh, or phases, concentric phases, um, and also how people are able to transfer the forces throughout the net chain. And what we see typically are interlimp, intralimp, and whole body compensations. One example of interlimp compensation is typically the unloading of the operated limp and the uh, increased loading of the um, non-operated limp, as you see here in this figure. And what we see as whole body compensation typically is, a, is finally a reduction of the external knee flexion moment, typically by stiffening the knee joint and using more um, trunk flexion, thereby creating a short lever arm between your knee joint center and your uh, vertical ground reaction force factor, uh, which is a typical strategy we see during running, during uh, deceleration tasks, jumping tasks, uh, and also during changes of direction. So again, um, we should also train these movements. It's not, it's not because you have a certain strength, that you can also develop the strength or use the strength during, for example, acceleration or change of direction activities. We know in football, your first few steps are key to be uh, highly performant on the, on the pitch. And it's not only about having the force, it's also by redirecting your ground reaction force vector in the appropriate direction. And also about the integration of your whole kinetic chain uh, when doing these uh, athletic movements. Also, in, ter in terms of change of direction, can be anticipated, but finally also unanticipated. We know that certain body positions can be uh, less optimal, but what's important here is also to focus not only on the body position itself at the end during the dece deceleration phase, but also in the steps before. And this is a thing also a fact that we, we focus not enough on, is deceleration capacity of football players. Why is that? Because we know that deceleration loads or deceleration activities are around three times more prevalent during football than high intensity acceleration activities. 
So we can train deceleration capacity, both from a technical point of view, but also just from a tissue capacity point of view with heavy load eccentric training. Yeah. And this is also a factor we can include in our training process. However, uh, just looking at the knee from a mechanical point of view might not be enough. We have uh, more and more evidence um, from a neuroscience point of view that um, altered knee or altered movement patterns might also be related to uh, alterations across the sensory motor system. And um, we have data now that uh, shows us that uh, changes in the central nervous system related to attention, visual processing, but also related to sensory motor uh, processing are related to or are less optimal in uh, ACL reconstructed patients. And we should also focus uh, there on uh, in our rehab process. So again, we have the knee, we have the knee within a biomechanical chain, but we also now have the evidence that we need to integrate our brain within, these, uh, within this whole concept. What we don't want is that players end up in situations as we see here, where they constantly have to think about their movement, about their body positions, et cetera, about their muscles. We already heard these presentations today. We really want to get rid of these internal focused instructions across the whole rear process, uh, because this is not really efficient when you are on a pitch where other players are moving around of you. Uh, which is a very high load for your uh, brain again, which is maybe less optimal in very high velocity, unanticipated uh, situations. Um, so at the end, what we do want to achieve is probably adaptability. Adaptability means that we want to create a, a, a broader performance zone, meaning that athletes can adapt in a uh, proficient way in or towards different tasks and different environments. And we can target our training uh, here also to be more adaptable. And maybe it's true that's not the strongest of the species that will survive, but maybe the ones that are most responsive to change. And changes in tasks and environments are key when we talk about football or being proficient in football. So we can do that in different ways. Again, here you see some examples uh, in our clinic of unplanned, more complex multidirectional movements, where we integrate cognitive aspects, where we integrate visual motor interactions, where we really want to focus on adaptability with a huge variation of tasks, environments, really progress them in challenging and also fun ways, as we already heard today. Huh? And at the end, we really want to progress to a situations where people or athletes can adapt towards changing uh, environments. That's what we really want to focus on at the end. Um, but we can also make it easier, of course, to implement this already more in the early phases of the training process. Um, it's not only important to train uh, in the gym then, but also to translate these findings or these approaches towards field situations. And we start there with more linear approaches but then we focus on multidirectional pre-planned movements, going to higher speed linear and multidirectional movements, and then implementing also more reactive components in the program to finally end up with, with more sport-specific, football-specific movements. But I will come back to that later on. Okay. And for those who are interested in these structured approaches, I think Matthew Buchthoff has done a great job in, in structure and structuring this process by um, giving a few uh, steps here or structuring the whole late stage process of, for example, football player across different steps. Now, when talking about sports specific skills, I also want uh, to mention here that to bridge the gap between rehab and performance, there is a key element here, which is on-field retraining or on-field rehabilitation. Before we go to training, before we go to competition and performance, we first need on-field retraining. And in the presentation of um, Dr. Walden, also we saw that actually the on-field uh, period is quite short, in, even in elite uh, athletes. 
So we need to take time. We know that it's important to bridge the gap between rehab and performance. We can start from an individual point of view, then go to small group and team settings. Now, again, I want to make clear that just the fact that you use a ball or the, the fact that you pass a ball or dribble a ball is not, does not mean that you are training sport specific. And th I think that's a big misunderstanding uh, currently in literature that it's not because it looks like the sport that you also train sport specific. Why is that? Actually, when you look at the game of football, you know that a player only receives 2% of the time or only has the ball in 2% of time. The rest of the time, the player doesn't have the ball. And this is something we clearly miss in our approaches. We, we think that we are training sport specifically by, by just uh, using the ball, but actually the rest, what happens without the ball in function of a team play, uh, we often miss. I think that's a, it's a big problem. And here I really like this quote of maybe one of the best midfielders we've ever seen, uh, Savi, where he understands football as space and time. If you have space, if you have time, you can think and you can become dangerous. So what football is, is a kind of a brain game, meaning that you have to orient yourself in relation to other players, in relation to teammates, in relation to opponents, in function of your tactical instructions. And you don't play football by your own. You play football with other players. So you are always in relationship to other players within a team. And that's a big difference. And I think we completely miss this piece of getting a player back to the field. And then I come here to some famous quotes of, of Johan Cruyff, who, who argues that you play football with your head and your legs are there to help you. And don't get me wrong. I don't say that the, the legs are not important, not at all, because I really also emphasize here in this presentation the capacity that we need. But it's true that it's far more complicated than that if you want to perform on a football pitch. And in terms of running and in terms of speed, again, it's also true that if you start earlier to run or if you are better able to position you on the field compared to other players, you appear faster. And being fast is not only related, related then to physical capacity, but also uh, towards your ability to position yourself on the field. And you can train that. You can also implement that uh, individually. Here you see again the complicated fact that you that the person on the field might perceive where he has to pass the ball here. But we can also process that or progress that towards more positional game plays where, um, where other players have to uh, put them in the right, right space and time to orient themselves on the pitch again. And you can do that step by step. And finally, come up with uh, group trainings. Here you see other uh, applications again. At first, it, this might seem simple, but what is the purpose here of this exercise that the player with the ball always have to orient themselves to have always two options to play. And those players without the ball have to position themselves always in 90 degrees uh, in relation to other players. And those without the ball always have to make cuts in 90 degrees, which is typical for high performance football, that you don't make curves, but cuttings. And this is already your old video. And by the way, the small guy in the middle is one of the top strikers now, but now this video is from his youth academy here, Dries Mertens from Napoli is here in the middle when he was 15 years old. Um, but I think, again, in rehabilitation, these kind of approaches are not yet uh, integrated. And we can make it more and more difficult to make it more clear for players where they are situated on the field, how they can uh, learn to um, have some spatial awareness on the field in relation to other players. And these kind of drills uh, are, can only be um, helpful when other players are taken into account the movement of their opponents. We structure training processes here in geometric figures to make sure that players can orient themselves better on the field. And especially when you have a long time off the field, it's a good approach or it could be a good approach 
uh, to implement this also in terms of uh, the RIA process. Okay. Finally, I want to, to mention that physical conditioning is of course also a very important pillar. Uh, has, the train, has the player trained enough is an important question. Do you have uh, really a restoration of the physical capacity, both from an aerobic but also from an anaerobic perspective? And again, then we start with the end in mind. Uh, what is the physical profile of my uh, athletes? What is the level of play? What is the position of play? Um, how can I progress towards really uh, physical requirements that are needed um, in a normal training week, but also in game situations? Uh, now, the final point uh, I want to mention here are also the points that uh, Linda already very nicely mentioned are psychological, social, and contextual factors, which play also a key role. Um, I think when, when we are talking about, for example, fear of re-injury, we have to know that these psychological aspects can also have an important influence on whole our neurocognitive processing and cause also uh, joint stiffness, dysregulations, or problems uh, in finally developing joint stability. Just to mention one example here, but psychological factors do play an important role. And also, we are always uh, dealing with contextual factors. Um, there are uh, studies available showing that even at the elite level, there is often a mismatch between what a player thinks he or she wants to do or what a coach thinks he or she has to do in function of return to play or what the medical staff thinks the player has to do. So at the end, we want to work together. And we want to come up with teamwork um, but in reality, it's often not the case. Often there is a mismatch between those people who are involved in the decision-making process, even at the elite level, where we see that it's often just the decision of a player itself um, to return to sport. So finally, again, we have some nice examples um, last couple of months where we see that often, even at the elite level, there are um, problems in returning to sport and staying on the field. So I think, um, again, when we talk about elite football, it's not only about uh, timing, but there, is also, there are also other factors involved, such as money, such as value. But I think it's our job as a professional uh, uh, persons uh, working with athletes as physical therapists or as um, uh, physicians to develop or to pursue a really high value care. Um, taking into account, of course, contextual factors, uh, but really we don't play with the career of these players. That's, 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 that's the most important message here, I think. And we have to be, or we have to do better uh, to improve our, the outcomes of our players. That's my final take home message. We have to do better. We have to come up with better solutions to improve our outcomes. If you want to get in touch, uh, you can, of course, follow me on my Twitter account or email me, of course, always uh, is also possible, or visit my website. I thank you uh, for your attention. And again, Mario, I thank you uh, for the invitation for uh, presentation, to have a presentation here today, uh, which was a big honor for me. Thank you.